Israel is in shock, and everyone feels on edge. The unexpected and brutal Hamas attack has unleashed a war, but it has also put the entire country on high alert. And of course, it has put its armed forces, the well-known Israel Defense Forces, on high alert. On high alert and also at full strength. Following a massive campaign of attacks by aerial forces, the armed forces has now begun the ground invasion of Gaza. We are talking about a military that has about 170,000 regular troops, but at the same time, as one of the largest reservist mobilization capacities in the world. There are currently some 360,000 reservists mobilized and ready to fight alongside professional forces. And if needed, almost half a million reservists could be deployed in combat. We are talking about ordinary citizens who in Israel are obliged to undertake military service and continue to undergo annual military training. Both men and women. Although in the case of women, there are more exemptions. All in all, the Israel Defense Forces have earned a reputation as one of the best armed forces in the world. According to its own military doctrine, losing a war is not an option. The survival of the small Hebrew state, which is surrounded by militias and enemy countries and hostile states, historically depends on its failure rate being zero. Clearly, from the founding of the modern state of Israel in 1948 to the present day, the type of internal and external threats they face have changed, and greatly, and along with them, so have its armed forces. But what are the Israel Defense Forces actually like? How have they been transforming and adapting to the various adversaries they face? And are they really prepared for what lies ahead? Well, we're going to tell you all this and more in this video, so let's get started. The Israel Defense Forces were formally founded on the 31st of May 1948, about two weeks after the State of Israel declared its independence. David Ben-Gurion, the Israeli Prime Minister, decided to integrate into them practically all the Jewish forces and military groups that existed during the British Mandate of Palestine and that were in charge of security of the various Jewish communities that existed in the area. We're talking about groups like Haganah, which, at that time, already had some combat experience. These militia groups came to form an alliance known as the Jewish Resistance Movement a few years before Israel's independence, which confronted the British authorities. This experience helped a lot in the future creation of the IDF, which would be a regular and organized force with its army, navy, and air force. These guerrilla groups had faced numerous attacks by Arabs against Jews in the Palestine Mandate, and in addition, had fought in both World World War I and World War II alongside the British Army. Keep in mind that the United Kingdom was the colonizing power in Palestine from 1920, following its victory over the Ottoman Empire, which in turn had controlled the region of Palestine for four centuries, almost without interruption. In fact, it is considered that the first Jewish armed forces in history were formed within the British Army, the Jewish Legion, which fought in the First World War. And in the Second World War, some 40,000 Jews also fought with the British Army against the Nazis. But let's not get too far ahead. The fact is that the initial idea was that the armed forces of the newly formed Israel would be based on a small, highly specialized, and organized professional force, and a huge number of non-professional troops. Recruits would be ordinary citizens, but who would have advanced military training? That is, if someone attacked Israel, all or almost all of its young citizens would have to be able to respond. And this is more or less still the situation today. However, from the IDF of 1948, which emerged on the spur of the moment during the invasion of five Arab nations against the newly created Israel, up to the present day, a lot has happened. And naturally, the environment in which Israel finds itself has also changed. Listen up. <laughs> A changing threat. Over the past 20 years, the threats facing the Hebrew state have changed dramatically. You see, during the creation of the State of Israel and during most of the second half of the 20th century, its main enemies were its own neighboring states. Logically, states with regular and professional armies. We're talking about Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, and since 1979, also Iran. In fact, Israel had wars or military confrontations with all of them throughout that time. With some, such as Egypt and Syria, even more than once. For its part, Syria is the 
only Arab country that has been at war with Israel and has not yet signed a peace treaty. To give you an idea, Syria had direct military confrontations with Israel in 1948, 1967, 1973, and 1982. In fact, after the signing of peace agreements with Jordan and Egypt, Syria became in terms of statehood, its only major threat, next to, perhaps, Iran. The point is that, for all this, the Israel Defense Forces were historically trained and prepared for what we could consider conventional warfare. However, in 2011, everything changed that paradigm radically. That year was when the Arab Spring broke out, which in Syria led to a civil war that still goes on to this day. And precisely because of that, the al-Assad regime not only ceased to be a threat to Israel, but the Syrian regime itself has been fighting for its own existence ever since. Its armed forces are in tatters. They do not even have control over the entire territory of the country. And to make matters worse, the legitimacy of the regime is more than questioned. And not only that, meanwhile, during that same time period, and as we already told you in our recent video on Hamas and Hezbollah, which if you have not seen, we will link for you in the description, the two most direct threats to Israel have become non-state military groups. Above all, we are obviously talking about Hamas and Hezbollah, two terrorist groups financed, trained, and armed by Iran. Well, as you can imagine, these groups do not operate as a regular military would in a conventional war, but employ asymmetric warfare. Or, in other words, they act primarily with terrorist attacks on Israeli soil, infiltrations to carry out kidnappings, sporadic rocket launches, or even cyber warfare and propaganda actions. <laughs> All this has meant that the Israel Defense Forces have undergone an enormous transformation in recent years. They have fundamentally done so through two major plans, which are in fact the only two that have been completed. In this video, we're going to talk about the grandest of them, the Gideon Plan, a five-year, $15 billion annual plan that culminated a whole process whereby Israel wants to have a much smaller but at the same time, much more lethal armed forces. To give you an idea, since 1985, Israel has reduced its number of tanks by 75% and its fighter planes by half. Above all, it is about having a military capable of confronting and fundamentally defeating groups such as Hamas and Hezbollah. Right now, they will have to demonstrate the effectiveness of all these changes with the intervention in Gaza. But in any case, this whole process has made us on Visual Politic ask ourselves a few questions. What exactly has the transformation of the IDF consisted of? Is the strategy carried out really as good as it is portrayed? Could Israel be making major mistakes in its defense doctrine? Well, we're going to tell you all about that right now, so stay tuned. A chameleon-like force. The Gideon Plan was launched in 2015 and approved by the Israeli government cabinet in 2016. The idea was to downsize, modernize, and reform the Israeli armed forces, starting with the number of troops. To begin with, the regular army was reduced from 45,000 to 40,000 troops, as was the number of conscripts. At the same time, compulsory military service was reduced by four months, and unless current events cancel it, is scheduled to be reduced by another two months in the next few years. But if anything has seen a cutback, above all is the reserve forces, which have been cut by 30%, or put another way, some 100,000 reservists were released from service. Now, you may find all this, and particularly with what is happening now in Gaza, very strange. Why would Israel's armed forces, which are far outnumbered by those of its neighboring countries, want to become smaller? Well, basically because of the adoption of a new military doctrine. The Israeli military now operates in much smaller areas than it did, for example, last century. The IDF no longer seeks to pacify threats by occupying extensive territories in an enemy state, as happened, for example, with the Sinai in Egypt on two occasions. The first time in 1956, for a few months, and the second time in 1967, after the Six-Day War, with an occupation that lasted 15 years. 
Now, the latest mission is to have operational control at all times over very limited hostile areas and to eliminate threats such as the ability to launch missiles or the existence of enemy tunnels in a very precise manner. In fact, in 2011, prior to this plan, Israel began implementing a new doctrine based on independent combat brigades. With this, the brigades can now act much faster and, in addition, communicate directly with the Air Force and Navy for support. There are no longer so many intermediate jumps that delay operations. And naturally, there has also been a change in training, weaponry, and priorities when it comes to placing a soldier in an operational position. You see, these days, infantry and armored corps are trained, above all, for two things, urban combat and the destruction of tunnels and other fortifications. As we have told you in recent past videos, Hamas has a huge infrastructure of underground tunnels over 500 kilometers or 310 miles long. This allows them to operate underground, to move from one part of the strip to another without the risk of going outside in the middle of a bombardment. And they also store a lot of weaponry, such as the infamous rockets they constantly launch against Israel. Even so, in the event of an urban war, which is what could happen in the next few days, if Israel does what it has warned it will do, these tunnels could become a real headache. Firstly, because they are much more difficult to destroy than an ordinary building. In fact, this has forced Israel to create an elite unit trained for this, the Yahalom unit which has more and more troops and means. This unit specializes in infiltration, underground close combat, and tunnel destruction. Be that as it may, the problem is that all this infrastructure makes Hamas a particularly elusive force. In the event of an Israeli urban invasion, Hamas guerrillas and snipers could move from one building to another and escape to a totally different location to emerge as if from nowhere without even setting foot on the street. The fact is that all these Hamas operations in tunnels and subterranean fortifications greatly reduces the usefulness of the artillery force available to the Israel Defense Forces, a force that was crucial in the 1960s and 1970s, but has now completely faded into the background. The problem with artillery is that it is conceptually designed to attack large, non-mobile, open field targets, and the war against Hamas in Gaza will be basically the opposite of that scenario. What's more, the wide range of artillery shells could increase the risk of friendly fire and collateral damage to civilians, making simply using artillery on a massive scale no longer an option. To address this, the IDF switched its artillery units to specialized drone units. Thus, the ZIK unit has Israeli-made Hermes 450 and Hermes 900 drones, which are very versatile. They can perform both intelligence and electronic warfare tasks and attack using missiles with high precision. On top of that, there is also another unit, the Skyrider, dedicated exclusively to intelligence gathering so that the rest of the armed forces can operate appropriately. Replacing a significant part of the artillery with drones? What do you think of that? Well, if you were surprised, there's still more. The Israeli military has begun to take the issue of cyber warfare and the use of technology for military applications very seriously. Precisely because of this, the Yaman, the military intelligence, has started using deep learning algorithms that scan millions and millions of data, such as images, videos, audio, and electronic signals to identify potential targets. These targets, selected by the algorithms, are then investigated by analysts, classified, and finally confirmed for actual attacks. This makes the Israeli Defense Forces tremendously effective in locating and destroying targets. But there is still more. The unit in charge of cyber warfare has also been greatly enhanced, to the point that the IDF has abandoned its old doctrine that every soldier has to undergo combat training regardless of where he or she ends up. The IDF now hires soldiers specifically to perform cyber warfare and intelligence tasks without having to perform combat services. In short, it's a radical change that has been underway in recent years, a change from which neither the Air Force nor the Navy have escaped. The Air Force, for example, has become much less important. Although it may seem contradictory at a time when Israeli fighters such as F-15s and F-16s are working alongside drones on targets in Gaza, it is the case. You see, Israel considers that it is no longer so important to make the effort to ensure air superiority since the war it is waging with Hamas and Hezbollah is of much lesser intensity. 
In fact, along these lines, the Israeli Air Force has in recent years prioritized stealth and precision strike capabilities far above its ability to deal with dogfighting for instance. Basically, because neither Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, nor Hezbollah have an air force, nor are they expected to have one in the near future. Precisely for this purpose, the air force has been reduced in size, but greatly improved technologically, especially after the addition of the F-35 fifth generation fighter in 2015. A fighter which, by the way, is not intended for dogfights, but which can reach very distant targets and carry out air-to-ground attacks, even with nuclear weapons. Watch out, Iran. And of course, we could not finish telling you about the changes that the IDF has undergone without telling you about the Navy. <laughs> Naval strength is a priority for Israel. The country functions, in practice, almost as if it were an island. In other words, 98% of the goods imported into Israel arrive by sea through the Mediterranean, and more than 80% of the population lives along its 197 kilometers of coastline. What's more, most of the country's critical infrastructure, such as power plants, ports, desalination plants, and even military installations are close to the coast. The problem? Well, the Israeli Navy was initially designed to confront Egypt's on the one hand, and Syria's on the other. For this reason, the Israeli Navy was composed of destroyers, large ships, missile launchers, and submarines. However, right now, it seems unlikely that Israel will ever again engage in sea wars with professional and well-equipped navies, especially after what the military chessboard looked like following the Yom Kippur War. As a result, Israel has dismantled all its destroyer ships, and the larger missile launchers have been replaced by much smaller patrol boats and missile launchers. Now, many of you may be thinking at this point, but isn't all this very risky? Is Israel totally ruling out a conventional war in the future? And what if something happens with Iran? Or if its relations with a neighboring country turn upside down? Well, you are right. And don't think that many of these things we are telling you about have not received strong criticism at home. Even from within the armed forces themselves, there have been senior officers who have been highly critical of some of these changes, particularly the Gideon Plan, and not without reason. For example, in 2006, the Israeli Navy was not able to be up to the task in the war against Hezbollah that took place on Lebanese soil, being unable to provide sufficient naval support. To give you an idea, this is what we are talking about. Israel now has very small and light ships, which are ideal for guarding the coast and having the occasional run-in with boats and such. But they don't have such strong anti-missile protection. And so the question that many are now asking is, could it be that Israel is focusing too much on Hamas and Hezbollah and has forgotten the possibility of a conventional war? What exactly is the defensive strategy that they've been pursuing over the last few years? And the most important question, is it working? Well, let's find out. The Self-Fortification of Israel Around the end of the 2010s, Israel drastically changed its military objectives. It would no longer seek the complete annihilation of its opponents. Rather, what has been done for years is to avoid major confrontations and to conduct constant but small operations that mitigate threats to a level of violence that is acceptable to the Israelis. The idea has been, therefore, to make an active defense but to armor up at home, a strategy known as self-fortification. Do you want examples? Well. You see, for starters, in both Gaza and the West Bank, there are hundreds of kilometers of fortified fences and dozens of kilometers of walls. Concrete walls like the one we can find in parts of the border with Lebanon, which is nine meters high, or in Gaza, which is six meters high. Now, it may have been explained to many of you watching through the press that all these fences and walls are to isolate the Palestinians and establish a kind of apartheid, right? Well, the reality has nothing to do with that, but rather with Israel's new security doctrine. In fact, if we dig a little deeper, we will see that these walls also have steel reinforced barriers. On top of that, around Gaza, there is, in addition to the wall you see on the surface, an underground wall that is, get this, 65 kilometers long, and up to 30 meters. That's almost 100 feet deep. Yes, yes, you heard correctly, 30 meters. 
What's more, land borders are replete with sensors, alarm systems, night vision cameras, and a host of other technology devices. Since 2010, there has also been a sea barrier along Gaza's maritime border with three layers. A breakwater, rocks with barbed wire, and lots and lots of sensors and detectors of all kinds. Evidently, all this gives us a clue as to where this is going. All these real 21st century fortifications are not to isolate the Palestinians, but rather the other way around, to isolate the Israelis from the Palestinians. In fact, the exceptional height of the concrete walls is to prevent sniper attacks, and the underground wall is to prevent Hamas infiltration from Gaza, leading to attacks on civilians and kidnappings. Something that, by the way, has already happened on several occasions. The point is that all this is also part of the IDF's new strategy. Basically, many believe that this is not a good way for Israel to go in the future. Rather, it is a sign of weakness. A nation that fortifies itself with fences, barriers, and walls is a nation that lives in fear. The more fences we built across the borders, the more our security doctrine became dependent on defense and self-fortification. A society that builds more and more fences is a society that lives in fear. Logically, it might seem that fortifications project strength, but the truth is that it does not. If anything, it projects fear. Of course, in the light of events of the 7th of October, if we can clearly say that they project anything, it is a false sense of security. A feeling that, for many, would partly explain why Israeli intelligence ruled out that Hamas could attack the country and why the military was unable to cope with the invasion. In the end, how could Hamas overcome all these barriers? Well, all it took was a few pickups, a few drones, some engines with parachutes, and a sudden attack on the sensors and technology deployed by Israel. The problem is that if we take this to the scale of war, Israel could be making the mistake of having over-adapted its military to asymmetric warfare, leaving it ill-prepared for a future conventional warfare scenario. That, at least, is the concern that many analysts are expressing. At the end of the day, who can assure them that Iran will never attack them? Or that some of the countries with which they now get along more or less well will suddenly change their position and become hostile again? Of course, if one thing is clear, it is that in the Middle East, we can never take anything for granted. Well, that is the big question that many in the IDF have begun to ask themselves. A question that today, with the situation of maximum tension in the region, has become very topical. However, we can't answer it for now, but what we can do is pass the ball to you. What do you think of the changes that the Israel Defense Forces have undergone? Do you think they are on the right track? Or, on the contrary, do you think that prioritizing asymmetric warfare so much could lead to a major security gap? Well, as always, leave us your comments below. And remember, if you like this video, like it, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any news. And if you want to keep up to date with topics that we do not touch on regularly in visual politic, you can do so by subscribing to our a Patreon, which also has many more advantages. We leave you the link in the description. As always, thank you very much for being there. All the best, and I will see you next time.